I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Today on the show, we have Joel Stein. He is a very talented journalist written for top publications across the globe for years. And Joel has this ability to take real, current, hard, intense issues and inject some sarcasm and humor into uh, the reporting and into the analysis of these issues, which I think in some cases allows us to actually digest them a little bit easier and have a more creative view on where we stand with certain things. But as he takes this reporting and he he splashes comedy into his journalism and his writings, I find that he often says out loud what a lot of people are thinking but would never say out loud. And he acts upon this too. In fact, in this recent Time magazine cover article, he was talking about trolls online. And so he invited his troll to lunch. This individual who's been trolling him for a very long time, he invited them to lunch and they actually went to lunch. We have this conversation about humor and its relationship with asking yourself the why not now question and taking action upon it. And I'm starting to come up with a hypothesis that potentially humor and comedy can insulate us from the fear that often keeps us from taking action on our why not now. Something to think about. Joel recently asked via the internet if Vladimir Putin could hack into the LA Times circa spring 2009 archives and find out why they fired him. (laughs) That's an example of how he takes a real timely issue and turns it a bit into relevancy and makes it a little bit more humorous than maybe it would be otherwise. Oh, and I asked Joel for some writing tips because he is an extremely talented writer. I got some very interesting feedback, and it's very helpful but unexpected, so I hope you enjoy that too. Before we hop into this episode, let me fill you in on a little secret of mine. That's Headspace. It's a guided meditation app, and I never imagined that doing something for 10 minutes a day could increase my quality of life so much. I've always struggled with knowing when to make things happen versus when to let things happen. Sometimes things go very well when I push on the gas, and sometimes not so much. It gets me into trouble. Headspace has helped me with learning how to trust my intuition And I've tried meditation off and on for years. It's never stuck, but this time it has. I've made a very intentional shift in my morning routine, and that's to wake up, have my coffee, do headspace, journal, and then I check my email, my social media, all of my devices. It's been a big shift, but great result. My aunt used to say, don't let anything rent space in your head for free. That's valuable real estate. Headspace allows me to be a much better landlord of my thoughts, especially first thing in the morning. You can go to headspace.com forward slash why not now for a free trial. And if you stick around to the end of the show, I'll tell you how you can get a month for free. Welcome to the show, Joel. I'm excited to have you on today. How are you doing? Lower your expectations. I'm not Mark Cuban. Oh, goodness. So to kick us off, 
Let's talk about your why not now question, your moment when you had to say to yourself, okay, this is it. Why not now? I'm doing this X, Y, Z. And what caused you to ask yourself that question? And what were the first steps? Well, I have a bunch of thoughts. One of which is I fear I never took a why not now moment. (laughs) I feel like I've been really safe. But if I had to kind of conjure up one or two, I would say not going to law school and trying to make money as a writer. And then I guess my second one was quitting my office job at Time Magazine and becoming a freelancer. So economically, those were kind of gutsy, but I don't feel like I've made a truly gutsy why not now decision. I think those are right in line with, you know, the economics behind this question are often the the biggest excuses, if you will, and not necessarily excuses, but are are a reasoning for not asking and following through with that question. So, so let's dissect that a bit. So, the law school deciding not to do that was money a big factor that that kept you from maybe not wanting to let go of law school. Yeah, but it was a vague idea because I was so young. I was straight out of college, and and now that I'm writing this book and kind of looking back on my life. I think I didn't really appreciate what having upper middle class parents who paid for my college and my dad was part of this family business that my grandfather and great uncle started. I don't know if I ever consciously thought I could go into that business, but I bet that felt like a safety net too. So I think I had a lot of safety nets I wasn't even cognizant of or processing. Yeah. But that said, it was part it was more just the general idea of not having a career and a job and money. So yeah, money was part of it, but yeah, I think just law school seemed like a real thing. Whereas, so, you know, trying to write for magazines or TV shows was not. So what ultimately helped you make a go at it and and decide not to go to law school or decide to quit at Time magazine? I had two really cool internships at college. And being at a college where people were leaving to go write, not many, but I knew people who got jobs as sitcom writers and at newspapers and magazines. So it, it seemed much more realistic having known people who did it compared to like growing up and not knowing anyone. Uh, and then those internships, the one at Newsweek in particular, made it seem like it was worth taking a chance. I see. So the scene is believing has come up a few times in terms it's of... It's weird, things. right? Like... It netted out that like when I would mention being like a sitcom writer to my dad, my very practical dad who grew up poor in the Bronx would say, there's like 12 people with that job. Like that's not, that's not a career. You know, that's like, that's like saying my plan is to win the lottery like that. And and then actually meeting people who were great people, but they didn't seem, you know, like some other creatures who, who got these jobs shortly after college. It just, it seemed much more doable. Uh, you've really paved this this path for yourself and and comedy and humor has been such a big through line of your career. Do you think humor and comedy really kind of greases the wheels when it comes to taking action on a why not now? There is something that I liked about comedy that I think most people who like comedy like, which is the rebellious nature. It's David Letterman telling NBC to screw off. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. And and so maybe, maybe if you do immerse yourself in comedy, you do get a little bit of that punk, you know, not in a very limited way, but some of that rebelliousness. Like little renegade type of just, yeah. Yeah. That would appeal. I mean, the way that like hip hop or rock probably appealed to other kids for the same reason that's what I liked about comedy more than anything. It was like, oh my God, I can't believe you can do that. The unexpected, the unheard of. More than the unexpected. It's just like, you're not allowed to do that and they're doing it. Why some people like extreme sports or, you know, it's the nerd version of all that. Well, and I was reading some of your recent headlines and one of them was um, you, you interviewed Ellen DeGeneres and wrote an interesting article titled Ellen DeGeneres on lesbian fish and why it was finally time for Finding Dory. Which just the headline is funny. And and then reading along and where did you get that idea to to actually dig in to that angle of the story? 
Oh, you know, I didn't. I was assigned that story. I'd never even seen Finding Nemo. So I went to the screening and I saw Finding Dory. I actually saw them backwards and I saw Finding Nemo that night. And I talked to her and like literally that day on the news, it broke that there, the trailer had lesbian in, lesbians in them, right? And so when you were given the assignment, sorry, just to, to clarify, what was the assignment? <laughs> oh, like go interview Ellen DeGeneres for Finding Dory. Period. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No other uh, angles to. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, so then the. Ah, that's more than you always do. That sometimes get. Um, and so, so I saw these news stories about lesbian fish, and so I asked her about it, and and she had not read those news stories yet. It was just that day. <laughs> so I was the one telling her about Thanks misinforming her gotcha. about the lesbian fish because it turned out it was lesbian humans that people were upset about. Um, so yeah, so I broke the news to her, and she was very funny about it. So so I used that. How did that, gotcha. How did that go down? So that conversation. Oh, I guess I was, yeah, I guess I was a tiny bit nervous. Seems touchy. I don't know. Uh, she, she found it hilarious and kept bringing it up. <laughs> Every time I asked something else, she brought up the lesbian fish. Oh, it's just awesome that you are able to bring topical current events that are important social topics, issues to, to light more through comedy. And when you, sit down to tackle an assignment and you have writer's block. What do you do? How do you work through it? Oh, I think writer's block is, um, not real. Oh, tell, tell me about this. It's you ever have like workout block where you can't get yourself to go to the gym. Totally. <laughs> it's very similar to writer's block or not eating chocolate block. They're all very similar block <laughs> and they all can usually be overcome by uh, money or yelling. <laughs> or motivation, maybe. Um, that's a great point. I I now um, will think about that differently. The writer's block is an excuse. Yeah, there's no muse that's going to show up if you wait long enough. I think what people are talking about when they talk about writer's block is the is a misunderstanding of what writing is. Writing isn't the typing part. Writing is figuring out what you want to say, and that's the hard part. Once you know what you want to say. If you're used to writing, I mean, if, if you never write, even just turning your thoughts into sentences is very difficult. But if you're accustomed to it on a pretty regular basis, the hard part is figuring out what you want to say and organizing those thoughts. So writer's block is often, I don't have anything to say. Okay. So that's a, a answer to a much bigger question. That's very interesting. Uh, and... <laughs> Changing gears for a minute here. When we first connected, I think it was because if I'm dated, it's probably 2009-ish, 10 maybe, you were writing an p- article on Shaquille O'Neal um, or you needed him to to share something, maybe write in his own words. I think I talked to you long before that. Okay. Well, poss- quite possibly. Um, well, and we, yeah, we, we worked on your personal brand. I remember you asked for I think that's the first call you. Yeah. And um, you had asked for some advice, and I'll never forget, and I use this in my talks all the time when I'm talking about humanizing brands, but you were kind of like, okay, what is this brand thing? And, and you had already had a huge following on Twitter, and you already had your brand, but you may not have realized it, or you may have just been wanting an experiential conversation on Brandy. But I said, okay, we're going to define your personal brand and talk it through, and you had this kind of aha moment of, so what is a personal brand audit again? And I talk, I explained and you said, so isn't kind of the ultimate personal brand audit your funeral, a person's funeral? Oh yeah. <laughs> it was so profound because you're right. I mean, literally at the end of the day and at the end of the life, who shows up, how they feel about you, what they say, who doesn't show up. That's a pretty good assessment, right? I know. And when I do think about <laughs> About that, I think about the fact that you can buy a Mets casket, and I'm like, I just think that's that's not what I'm going for. Like, I don't want my whole life to be defined by being a fan of the, the New York Metropolitan. <laughs> that's quite interesting. I didn't know that 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 was the case. I mean, yeah, literally the case. <laughs> yeah, pun intended. Personal brand thing freaked me out when people started talking about that. How do you feel about it now? Sad, but accepting. Okay. Yeah, it is a thing, isn't it? 
your digital footprint. It's it's amazing how far it's come. And so last we spoke a month or so ago, you were writing this article on internet trolls. Oh yeah, I handed it in. You did. I still have a couple things to do, but I handed it in. It was a it was a really nice way for me to um, uh, procrastinate even further on my book. <laughs> Because it was like, oh, a Time article. I know how to do that. So it wasn't writer's block. Uh, so that was your form of writer's block at the time for your book, right? Oh, yeah. I totally <laughs> learned that one way to get myself to procrastinate more efficiently is to do some other work that isn't due. So what, I'm procrastinating because of panic, usually, or not knowing what to say. So if I can use the procrastination to do something that isn't so scary – Possibly because it's not due for a long time or it's easy. I'll go do that. So in that case, what is your book about? Or can you share with us uh, what we can expect? And maybe we can give you a deadline and get this get this thing on the road. Oh, my God. <laughs> I have a hard deadline in less than two weeks. Um, you had a hard deadline less than two weeks last time I talked to you a month ago, though, too. <laughs> now, they get, they get more angry each time. I know. Believe me, I'll never forget. I was scared to death of them. I didn't know you could push it, so I'll know next time around. I've always prided myself in handing things in exactly on time because I think that's why my career is done. One of the reasons my I've done okay in my career is because, unlike most writers, I never miss deadlines. And now I'm missing deadlines, and it's really upsetting. So what is this book about that's, that's causing this? Problem. Okay, so I sold my first book, didn't sell that well. Then the publishers from that same book offered me another book deal for like half as much money, but it was still really nice of them. But we didn't ever come up with an idea. So it was kind of like they started paying me, and I hadn't even come up with an idea yet. And totally freeing, but... The best we came up with was like a series of essays about stuff in my life. And then I tried to do this kind of postmodern nonfiction thing that didn't work that well. And so I abandoned that and they're just straightforward essays now. Gotcha. And the essays, is there, is there a theme? No, that's, there should be. There's no reason to read this book. There's no theme. There's oh, we need to go back to our branding conversation, marketing right now. No, no more of that. You can't be saying that. I believe there is a theme. Uh, there's a reason why people are following you. Now we're going to turn into a motivational kind of banter. Um, and maybe it's just time to let go of wanting a theme. Yeah, no, I have let go. And I've also written... A lot of so my my new strategy has been to write a lot of words, hoping that some of them are okay. So I've written I want it to be a short book because it's just funny essays, right? I don't want to read a long book of funny essays. And uh, so I've written I think I've written two books worth of stuff, hoping there's one book in there. There you go. So back to the troll article real quick. When we hung up the phone and, and we talked through the psychology of trolls and, and not only was it funny, but it's actually a little bit disturbing and a serious conversation. But you said, you know, I just need to go and find a troll and go spend some time in their basement with them. Did you? No, not yet. I've been trying for like a year. I, I'm not, not hard enough. I need to go on like 4chan and just dig one up. But, you know, I, I talked to my troll. I took my troll out to lunch. Oh, let's talk about that which serves some of the purpose of that. Um, and my editor doesn't really care if I go out and find a basement troll. So he wants me to be doing <laughs> other things for that story. So when you took your troll out to lunch, and, and when you say you're a troll, you mean the person who has, has heckled and trolled you? Or at least one? Yeah, there was one that was, um, oh, wait, you know, she was on me a lot, but then it got a little weirder because apparently we were in the same place at the same time. And in real time, she was threatening to kick my ass Whoa! at the restaurant we were at, uh, the restaurant opening. And then, and then she kept, she offered again later to beat me up somewhere that I, I go to often. Offered. <laughs> yeah. And I was with my wife and kid the first time. That's just an excuse because I'm just scared for my own body. But, uh, yeah, it was just weird that someone was seeing me in places and, you know, I don't know. It was a little weird. It wasn't a big deal, but it was as close as I got to a troll. And how did that all play out? So you went, you, she said, yes, I want to go to lunch. Shows up. How did that conversation start? 
It's great. She's <laughs> she is a stand-up comedian. She is this tiny, um, tiny Daria-looking young lesbian who um, has never had a job and lives off of food stamps and whatever she makes off of writing for like Vice. Uh, and I, when we ordered our food, I was just talking to the waiter who's a nice guy, and she said, "You're a people person, aren't you?" Uh, which I was like, I guess so compared to you, but I really liked her. She was really funny. And, uh, it, it was interesting. It was, you know, when you troll someone, it's kind of more about you than it is about them. I think I was kind of immaterial to her. I represented something that for good reason she didn't like, like how unfair is the world that this guy is getting paid really well. He's not much better than me. If maybe probably worse than me, I'm not making much money. I'm really struggling. Um, and he's like bragging about it. And I, I totally get that. It, you know, it made her super angry. So now you have empathy for your troll. I totally have empathy for my troll. Yeah, no, I like my troll a lot. Lucky. <laughs> well, do you think there will be another lunch date anytime soon, or how did this lead? How did this end? I don't know. You know, I don't. I I try and avoid lunch dates because they eat up your whole day. When friends are in town, I'll go to lunch or. Um, I don't know. I, I try. It, it is hard to add new friends at this age who aren't like my kids, you know, friends' parents. Yes, there's only so much time in the day, and it's something that it's on my mind constantly, and that's part partially why the Why Not Now show started. Especially the kid <laughs> thing. Like, I know that my kid's going to tur- turn to a teenager or go to college, and then be like, "Why don't you have any friends or a life?" And I want to be like, "Because of you." Like I used to, and then I didn't, and. And now I never will again. <laughs> oh, you have a, a little bit of time to make some friends before then. So you can add that to your list of things. To but do. not like friends like I used to have who were a big part of my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, let's catch up. Like I, used to, I used to, you know, you know, you know how life works. You've read about it. <laughs> yes. And kind of the, one of the things that I've been wanting to ask you, and, and I just read um, Stephen King's book on writing. Oh, that's really good. I haven't read that. I did like it a lot. I had no idea he was so funny. Um, I'm not a big Stephen King fan uh, until now, (laughs) but I I don't love necessarily his style of of content. But you know, when Entertainment Weekly fired me as their back page columnist, they hired him. So he was the back page columnist for Entertainment Weekly for a long time, and it was a he was trying to be funny, and he kept referring himself in third person as Uncle Stevie. (laughs) <laughs> which was always really creepy and weird. But um, yeah, his ability to tell a story and structure a story, you know, regardless of whether you like those kind of stories or love his sentences, is is near perfect. Like he's an amazing storyteller. Yeah, That's yeah. why all his books get turned into movies because you don't have to do anything. Like the story's right there. <laughs> it's for all the lazy, lazy directors. And <laughs> um, well, Buy this book because you think it's beautiful and interesting and you realize there's – you can mask a lot of story problems in a book that you can't mask in a movie. His yes, his concise way of of writing and um, kind of disdain for too many adjectives and descriptors was really resonating with me. Exactly. So, what's your number one writing tip? And if you don't have a number one, I'll take a few. Writing tip. Wow. Um, this has to be a question people ask you often, no? Yes. Well, I guess it's the thing I said before. You have to figure out what you want to say before yeah. you go yeah. sit down and say it. Do you have another one? Another writing tip. Well, it's just obvious stuff. Like when you edit someone's piece, you usually take out the first chunk. It's just throat clearing. Like you have to get to what you want to say right away. Um, you know, all that like build up and description. And my, I guess I had a playwriting teacher in college who said, uh, start, start the play five minutes before the action. Before the main action, you know, you just get to it is the, is the bottom line. Um, that's a good one. I didn't know that. I mean, I I hadn't heard that one before. Yeah. Everything else you've heard a million times, like show don't tell or, uh, what are the other trait things people say? They're all true. So all the, the cliches that we could Google. Okay. You don't have any fancy secrets other than there's no such thing as writer's block. It's largely a, uh, you know, try and tell the, the hardest truth you can try and have amazing. A lot of writing is just empathy. It's just like trying to figure out how other people feel. 
it takes a long time. I always forget how long it takes to write. I'm like, I'm going to write this book chapter today. And then like 10 days later of me writing every day, I'm like, I don't understand why I'm not getting this done. Have you ever considered going into other mediums because of that? I mean, you have dabbled in TV, of course, but um, podcast or anything like that? Yeah, I did a podcast last year. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. It was behind the paywall and we it took me 18 months to make five of them. So it was uh, it was insane. We tried to do a very This American Lifey overreported kind of thing. It was it similar to other stuff I've written. It was called um, What's Wrong With Me? And so in each episode, I tried to improve something about myself. And that ended? Did it just uh, wrap up? The project was complete timeline-wise, or did you decide to end it? Uh, I, I agreed to five. Okay, gotcha. At the get-go. And then if, if it had been a huge hit and easier to do, I would have totally made more. But it was... Neither of those things. I see. I saw your millennials, um, kind of the day in the life of a millennial video, and it was funny. So I wrote this cover for Time on Millennials, and the website was like, would you please make a video, basically to promote it? And I said, no, I don't have any great ideas to make a video. They're like, well, why don't we do a day in the life of a millennial? I was like, that doesn't seem honest to me. That's just a bunch of jokes, right? That's not interesting and has nothing to do with the article. And I had some friends at time.com and they were really desperate. So I agreed to do this thing. And, uh, and then the, the crappy thing about you make a video for like six minutes with an article you worked on for like six months and no one reads the article and everyone was this dumb video. So yeah, I re- it, was, it was just like, also you don't want to make a comedy video with Time Magazine. Like, you want to do that with Funny or Die, with funny people who know how to make a funny video. <laughs> like, it, it was just, like, edited wrong, and, like, all the ideas were wrong. It was just so um, amateur. It just, it's just, like, I don't want to do comedy with a bunch of people who don't do comedy. Every time I work with, like, an organization that's trying to, like, fix themselves and do something new, and they're out of their element, it's just a bummer. It's a very, it's an interesting point. I mean, here you did work for so long on this, this piece and especially if this video that was a bit of a promo asset that's kind of last minute trumps it. Uh, it's, and no pun intended there. There's too many Trump references, but. I've done that. Like, okay. I did this cover for time on George Clooney in which he came to our house and I made him dinner and during, and I knew that they want some video, right? But we were drinking and I was forgetting and then he, this beeping went off in my house and he, he had been a handyman, George Clooney. So he was interested in finding the beeping, whereas I wanted to pretend it wasn't happening and continue the interview. So he went under my house and got this ladder and he went into my attic, which I'd never been to before. We, we forever called the Clooney attic afterwards. And, <laughs> uh, and I grabbed my video camera and like, just it was shaky and dark and bad, but it was real, right? Yeah, you can't make that up. <laughs> yeah, and I thought that video was great because I think when people read the article, they're like, "Did Clooney really come over your house?" And then you have this video to prove it, and it was just it it seemed so unprocessed and real that and funny that like you know he was funny and it was a weird situation. So like that video, I'm totally happy with, but the manufactured unfunny one is a bummer. You know, that's a really good takeaway though. We can often overbake or overcook production. You can overbake production when you're working with James Cameron, right? Sure, sure. Like that's the time to focus on the details. But but if you're throwing up stuff on Instagram or YouTube to be funny or prove that it happened, I mean, this is punk DIY. That's you know. <laughs> yes. You didn't watch Letterman for the beautiful production values. Um, so, yeah, I think to know where to spend your energy is smart. Ooh. And who to work with. It's a great tip. That's a great tip. So the the other part of the why not nowness of this show is to talk about something that you've been considering doing that you haven't done yet. Uh, it could be big. It could be small. It could be something you've been thinking about forever. It could be a recent thing. But it, let's talk it through and dissect it and kind of figure out what's maybe keeping you from doing it or what we need to do to, to move forward. So what is that thing? I guess there's a couple of things, but if I had pick one that lasted the longest, I'd say probably writing a novel. 
And you kind of have done that though, right? No, never. Okay. So a book different, an actual novel, a, a fiction. Fiction. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And what's, what's keeping you from doing that? Writer's block? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, I have no experience in it. So it would be, I'd be, I'm going to talk myself out of it very easily. I'd be sitting alone doing something that was unlikely to ever make money or probably even be published instead of working or spending time with my family. Is this something you really want to do? It's just something that you think you should do because remember our conversation earlier about to kind of figure out if it's really something that you have to say, do you have something um, that maybe is underlying there? I don't, know if there's something I really want to do. Like, I'm 45. I mean, this is how I talk myself out of things, too. But I just feel like I don't know if there's something I'm burning to do that I'm willing to really sacrifice for. Well, and this is interesting because this is the first time I've had a guest kind of uh, answer in this regard. And there's not a right or wrong question. That's that's a... No, I don't know. I, I wonder if I make excuses for myself for not doing things. But then I also wonder if, if it's healthy to, and again, this might be an excuse, but if it's healthy to have like these burning career passions when you're older. Well, it doesn't have to be career centric either. I mean, it could definitely be personal. Maybe it's connecting with friends again. <laughs> you mentioned that. Or, or it'd be like one thing I did in that podcast <clears throat> for my fifth episode was try to give back, which I never do. So I try to be useful to the world in some way. Um, and I think that that might be fulfilling. That might be what I should be doing. Absolutely. I think it would be fairly easy if you thought it through and concepted a bit on how to kind of bake that into your existing day life world, you know? Yeah. I found something that kind of worked well, but I think there's probably other stuff I can do. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. Well, let's go with that one for a second. So what would be the first step? Let's say you you decided I do really want to give this a go and um and find a way to bring in uh more uh, purpose and give back into you know, my day. What would be the first thing you think you would do? Would you talk to your wife about it? Would you um talk to, you know, peers to sit down and and map out some ideas? That sounds like a logical way of doing it. Um, I, yeah, I have some friends who've gone into government recently, into the State Department. Uh, it's probably not a place that would have me because of stuff I've written. But I don't know. I, I think after the little exploration I did, the most use I can provide is just to give money or raise money, sadly. Um, I thought I had, my skills are limited. So, I sat with a bunch of kids uh, and helped them on their college essays. And I was like, oh, this is a very specific skill set that I have, writing about yourself. Um, so that, I felt useful there, I think. I mean, I don't really know if those kids got into those colleges or even, even finished the final draft of their essay or what they did. But it, it is surprising how useless my skills are. Like, I don't have that many skills that I can use to help people. You are so humble, and we need a little confidence session here. <laughs> no, but, I mean, think about it. It's not like, even I thought about, oh, I'll write your, like, press releases, your brochures for your NGO. And it's like, I, I could probably do an okay job at that. But, like, my real skill of being, like, writing funny, self-deprecating essays is not what they want. Well, I think just your your mentality and the way you look at things, the lens that you have brings a, a really interesting, lighthearted humor comedy to the, to the scene. But I think actually you might be surprised how that could be applied when, whether it's a, um, a nonprofit or it's, you know, helping from a, a messaging content standpoint, just your time of, Hey, I know you're trying to solve this big problem, XYZ brand or charity, um, happy to, you know, see what I can do to help with a phone call for an hour or something like that. You might be surprised. I would be very surprised and thrilled. 
do that. <laughs> well, I think it's not as far off as you might think. Uh, well, you you have taught comedy or humor humor writing. Is that correct? In the past, oh, I taught a, I taught a writing class at Princeton that focused on humor writing for a semester. That how, was great. How does one learn to write humor? You know, um, I kind of picked a bunch. Of, I I was on this VH1 show called I Love the '80s that was popular with like high school and college kids, and so. I got tons of applicants for my class at Princeton. Like, in, like, so I got to pick exactly the kids I wanted. And I picked the kids who were good writers and weren't necessarily funny because I figured we could teach them that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was a writing class. And then I, I taught them this skill that I thought they would need occasionally, which was, you know, there are some situations as a reporter that you can only report, I think, by being funny. Or, or situations in life that you can, you can look at and make them more interesting that way. And they were good at it, even the ones that are like totally serious, you know, bio pre, pre-med Princeton students. Like, they were good at it. Is this something I could try that you could give me an assignment? Or would I need to come and take a full class? No. <laughs> no, the class was ridiculous. It was, I'm, <laughs> well, one thing I do, one writing tip I do like that I kind of stole – from that playwriting teacher that I made the Princeton kids do. I don't even know if it's that good, but I love this, which is I tell people to get a friend to secretly record your conversation uh, sometime. Uh And then you transcribe the part where you're talking. And so you can see what your voice looks like in print. And from there, I believe you can find your writing voice or at least one of your writing voices. So you take what it looks like when you talk and you cut it down and turn it into the most interesting version you can and kind of both cut it down and maybe pump it up a little bit. And that's your writing voice. Did that make sense? I usually explain Uh, it. Yeah, that's brilliant. I think that's an awesome tip and it's gold. That's what my teacher did, which was so useful for me, was he made us secretly record some kids in our dorm. And the the point of that was to see just how differently people talk from each other. So you don't write all your characters the same, which honestly, most people do. And it's weird and a bummer. Uh, But but for writing prose in print, I think it's really important to know your own voice and to at least at least see what it sound, see what it looks like when you talk. That's really clever, and it makes so much sense that you would be able to learn and arrive at your writing style voice through that. That's very cool. Uh, a couple of last-minute rapid-fire type of questions. Oh, that's what I like better. Good, good. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Okay, what are you reading right now? Oh, uh, Michael Kinsley's book on aging. Good job. Okay. I like the prompt response. What keeps you up at night? Uh, my wife. There you go. <laughs> Horrible sleeper, and I'm an amazing sleeper. Uh, that's awesome. And pirates or ninjas? Who's tougher? Tougher? Yeah. Ninja. Who has more fun? That's a great question. Are they gay pirates or straight pirates? They can be whatever you want them to be. I think gay pirates have the most fun. Okay. That's a good one. And what advice would you give to your younger self? To realize that everyone's brain is very different from each other's. Okay. Should I try again? You didn't like that one. No, I liked it. I was just trying to keep our flow. I think that's actually quite uh, valuable. I wish I could wrap my mind around that many times a day. (laughs) Or or to not believe in free will, maybe, I would tell my younger self. I don't know. Have you ever written your younger self a letter? No, I haven't. Um, That'd be interesting. Be interesting. I don't think I have any uh, pink or purple pens in my house, <laughs> which I think is necessary for that assignment. I definitely would have some some skincare suggestions for my younger self. Um, <laughs> also, I did do this conference once where they made us write a letter to our future self a year later, um, and then they ma- we had we had to mail it to someone else at the conference who because then they would mail it to us. I don't remember what I said. At all. Um, but it seemed, seemed cool as an idea. Yeah, absolutely. Pre, you know, his, historically and in the future. Uh, and who do you think should run for president? Cory Booker. 
There you go. I'm a big Cory Booker fan as well. I'm actually, he was actually a friend of mine from college. Really? Oh, I edited his column a little bit. That's that's pretty exciting. And do you think he will give it a go? Maybe 2020? Pending. He's a really amazing person. Like, I actually have a lot of respect for almost all, for most politicians. Like, I think most of them really make sacrifices and want to help the country. But his sacrifices are weird. Like, um, that place he lived in in Newark, that was scary. Yep. Like, yeah, he's just a re, he's a really giving, sacrificing person. And it's, it's weird. I don't, and he's normal. He's like a funny, normal dude. I, I never understand that part of him. It's a big part of him. And I don't know anyone else who's quite like that. It, you know, I was just thinking about your why not now question and wanting to give back more, just helping Corey with his positioning and presence as you already are is one form of that, a big one. I've offered Corey, I've offered Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA. I just don't think I'm that useful. I think you, you are not giving yourself enough credit there, but, or maybe you just don't know how to apply your talent maybe, um, and to help other people, but it's, you're not, it, it's there. It's there for sure. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining me, Joel. This was awesome. And I am excited for your book and um, wait, wait, before, before you go, as far as why not that in my own life and, and even more in other people's lives, I've observed that the only time people, the, the time people usually make the big jump into something they've wanted to do is when they've been forced into it, which is usually being fired or their, or their businesses fall apart or they're, something happens in their life that they didn't ask for. Mm -hmm. And that's when they, and they look back on the firing and was like, best thing that ever happened to me. And what they really meant is like, finally forced me to do this thing. Absolutely. 100%. And I think that's. Until I quit writing for time, I'm not going to do all these other things I want to do. Yes. You have to make space and sometimes someone has to make it for us, right? It's not space. It's not time. It's, um, it's, panic it's being you know it's it's having having to do it is is what it is yeah absolutely i mean it's 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 a type of being forced that may not be as welcomed but you probably really want it anyway or i wrote my first sitcom pilot after entertainment weekly fired me which was after time got rid of my column after 9 11 see that's i and you were fired from la times right You've had, you have a few firing stories and they were probably the biggest, if you tracked them on a chart, they are probably paralleled with your biggest jumps. For sure. Yeah. See, that's, that's pretty amazing right there. It's everyone's story. It's yeah, I think it's pretty common, but yeah, being fired sucks, but it does give you a chance to do something slightly different and find out what opportunities are out there. Yeah, it's that nudge that you don't have much of a choice. So, And that's where I, I, I speak with so many people who are not happy with their jobs. Well, they're they probably as good at me as getting fired. I have a, I have a knack of getting, <laughs> getting fired, which has helped me a lot. That's a skill you could help uh, people with. There you go. I could tell people how to get fired pretty easily. <laughs> I, you know, maybe that's another, that's an article. Yeah, that's or a just, chapter. Or a chapter, of, yeah. Absolutely. How to get fired. I, yeah, I think that's it, actually partially how I made my big transition is I ended up, uh, letting go of a client, which in a way was firing myself from that work. And, um, and there were some pretty big transitions after that. And it's, it's a hard stop usually that creates that inertia that, okay, shit, I've got to go do something else now. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we figured it out. All right. I'm going to get fired. Okay. Me too. <laughs> it's good to talk to you, Joel. Talking to you too. Bye-bye. It's funny how someone who is so talented, like Joel, sometimes needs someone else to talk them through how to not only appreciate, but apply you know, some of their talent in other ways. And... Um, the humility that Joel brings is, is fascinating to me because he has so much to offer yet, as you just heard, 
we don't always see ourselves in the same way that other people do. And it helps to have that conversation. I got an email this week from a woman, her name's Stephanie. And about a year ago, she decided to start her own company. And she said that she's been plagued with imposter syndrome. She has many years of experience in the field that she's in, but she's just been struggling with with feeling like she is legit, I guess you would say. And so she said that when she came across this podcast, she thought, oh, I don't need to hear another Mark Cuban story or Troy Aikman or whatever it may be. Um, and she shied away. And then she started to listen. And she said that she was finding a lot of peace in hearing that a lot of these stories are not your typical hero success, what was it like when you won the Super Bowl type of stories, but they're more about that daily struggle and the dissection of, you know, what really helped you take that next step. And I thought this was a great opportunity to share with you that some of these guests are very high profile and some of them aren't necessarily. And that's important to me because as we go from episode to episode, we start to see these themes and these trends, the labels that we put on people and these pedestals that we often put on people, um, they just are, are really not valuable. <laughs> and they start to uh, distance us from what really allows us to understand that we're all the same <laughs> and we all struggle from the same things. And it's important to hear the whole story, not just the good, but also the those times of struggle and those learning moments. They're the most valuable and help us kind of take that next step. So Stephanie, thank you so much for reaching out. Quick shelfy club, book club update. I did finish Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Talked a little bit about that last week. It was good. It was very educational and enlightening. And I'm starting right now The Power of Kindness by Piero Ferrucci. He is a psychotherapist and talks a lot about the science behind kindness and empathy. Finding that interesting. And I'm also previewing a book by Eric Wall. It's called Spark and Grind. Eric will be on the show down the road. I look forward to you hearing from him. Speaking of kindness, I've mentioned a few times in the past that I've joined the kindness.org team. And we are on a mission to reach 1 million acts of kindness over the holiday season. We've partnered with the Today Show and NBC, and you can go to kindness.org to find out more. There are so many organizations right now that are asking for money and giving in, in the form of money, but really we're just asking for time, time to be kind. As simple as one minute can be enough to do a kind act, whether that's online or it's in the physical world. Uh, take a look at kindness.org and you'll see what I mean. I want to hear what your why not now is. Please share it with me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Amy Jo Martin. I'll send a signed copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Renegades Write the Rules, to the first 200 people who listen, rate, and leave an honest review of the podcast in iTunes. And you'll also get a free month subscription from our friends at Headspace. This is only available to Why Not Now listeners. Once you've left a rating and review on iTunes, just email your iTunes handle name and your mailing address to whynotnow at amyjomartin.com and we'll get your package in the mail to you. For detailed show notes, head to amyjomartin.com forward slash whynotnow. That's where you'll find links to things we discussed on the show, special offers, and how you can keep in touch with guests. Hat tip to my buddies Ash and Devin at Rock Salt Music for our tunes today. You just listened to the talented John Coggins in Let's Go and Let It Ride. And a jump high five to my talented husband, Richard Gruer for producing the show and being patient with me. See you next time. Until then, why not now?